You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is February 16th, 2024. We are doing board review questions presented by Dr. Michelle Manios. She is an allergy and immunology fellow at Children's Mercy Hospital. Um, so here are my board review questions, and let's go to the first one. So a 15-year-old girl comes in with acute abdominal pain preceded by onset of erythematous non-urticarial rash. Lab tests were performed, and results are C4 level is low, C1 inhibitor antigen is low, C1 inhibitor function is low, C1Q is normal. And what do you guys think is the most likely diagnosis? Gonna need a second on this one. HAE is not. Oh, I know. Ones. Okay, that's why I yeah. did this because I'm like, I never know like what these mean. And then I have the next slide and like a nice chart that kind of shows you guys like the breakdown of how to think through them. So, so even just the age, I know it's probably not acquired. Me just kind of test taking skills. That one you kind of get later on in life. Good point. Um, Good point. So I would kind of knock off choice A. Um. Type 1, I mean, obviously, like you have your kind of two types, but both you have the antigen low, but the second one, it's just the function is low. Um, mm -hmm. So, C4 level should be low. I think it might be A, or B, B, sorry, type 1, H-A-E. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. Um, why can't I go to the next slide? There we go. Um, so you guys are right. And then just a little bit about HAE. So the serping one gene mutation in type one hereditary angioedema results in the functional deficiency of plasma protein C1 inhibitor. So low level of functional protein, which also results in a low function level. And then this results in the depletion of C4 through increased activation of the classical complement pathway. And then type 2 HAE mutations result in secretion of a non-functional C1 inhibitor protein. So you can have normal C1 inhibitor antigen, but the function level will be low. But again, here you see C4 levels low in both type 1 and type 2 HAE. And although both type 1 HAE and acquired C1 inhibitor deficiency have low C4 and C1 inhibitor levels. Like you said, so, so the patient's age makes the type 1 HAE more likely than acquired C1 inhibitor deficiency, which is more often seen in older patients, not younger ones like this one in the question. Um, and then patients with HAE types 1 and 2 do not usually consume C1 complex. If patients present with this, then that kind of supports the diagnosis of angioedema secondary to acquired C1 inhibitor deficiency if a C1 complex is consumed. And I found a nice little chart in the board review book that has kind of type 1, type 2 hereditary angioedema. And on the far right, you can see both of them have decreased C4, but type 1 has low absent protein and low function, but type 2 just has the non-functioning protein, but normal levels of it. And then you can kind of look through and see ages of onset. Like we mentioned, older people usually uh, over 40 is when you kind of think of the acquired C1 inhibitor deficiency, if like the labs kind of fit that picture as well, and then clinical features. Next question, a 31-year-old woman that is a medical student with EOE wants to learn more about her disease process. You tell her that it involves eosinophils being home to the GI tract. Which gene do you tell her is most highly expressed in the cell trafficking pathway for eosinophils in EOE? Like the eotaxin, I think it's either A or B. Is it TCL? Uh, is it is it eight? Is it You're right. Eight. I think it's What's twenty-six. Yeah, CCL eight is the same as like IL eight or whatever. 
Yeah, so you're right about the eotaxin part. So said, but that is CCL26, like oh, Chow mentioned. 26. Okay. Got yeah. It. So CCL26 or eotaxin pairs with the eotaxin receptor CCR3 for homing of eosinophils to the GI tract in like eosinophilic GI disorders. Nice. And a little bit about EOE, kids when they present, they have vomiting, feeding difficulty, food refusal, poor weight gain. In adults, you can see dysphagia, food impaction, chest pain, excessive chewing of food, and frequent drinking of water with food, avoiding hard or chewy foods, and refractory GERD. Diagnosis is EGD of biopsy showing 15 or more eosinophils per high fat per high-powered field, and then morphological features that you could see on endoscopy of the esophagus show like exudate, rings, edema, furrows, strictures. Um, and then IL-5, IL-13, and eotaxin-3 are very important cytokine mediators in EOE. Eotaxin pairs, like I said, with the eotaxin receptor CCR3 for homing of the eosinophils into the GI tract. And then Another way to say this is that it's chemotactic for eosinophils. IL-3 creates more of the eotaxin, and then IL-5 increases and activates eosinophils. And here's like a little endoscopy. Oops, sorry, were you, was someone going to say something? Oh, no, you're good, Michelle. Um, here's the endoscopy slide of like the esophagus. You can see like the furrows, the plaques that are seen with, this, with the EOE. Next question, a 15-year-old boy with EOE and they're not all going to be EOE. I just went down this line because I thought some of these were some good questions. Um, has not responded to initial medical therapy. You discuss the spectrum of food elimination diets and next options. You partner with him in shared decision making and he finally like reluctantly agrees to try eliminating just one food protein. Elimination of which single food protein has the highest statistical likelihood of improving his symptoms? So milk, milk, milk mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So milk is the most likely food protein allergy to be implicated in driving EOE symptoms. And that's like a reasonable starting place for patients who are hesitant to be like more aggressive with an elimination diet. So if you could pick one, I think that one could possibly provide the most relief. And then for management of EOE, elimination or elemental diets, acid suppression with PPIs, topical glucocorticoids to decrease esophageal inflammation, and esophageal dilation to treat strictures if present. And I found this on up to date. I kind of like this table. It shows like the causative foods based on the six food avoidance diets and uh, reintroduction. And so for adults, most problematic and the ones that you might get the most benefit to avoid is wheat and cow's milk. And then there's also egg, shellfish, nuts, and soy. And in the pediatric population, cow's milk is 65 to 74% of the most causative food followed by egg, soy, wheat, and peanut. And a little bit on the dietary modifications you can do with EOE. Empiric elimination diet is kind of the most commonly used dietary therapy. And diet based on this, con on this concept, basically, that the empiric avoidance of these foods that most commonly cause immediate hypersensitivity in the population would also resolve like EOE if you avoid these foods. So cow's milk is the most common trigger in kids and one of the top triggers in adults. And so given this, cow's milk elimination only has been the most common initial empiric elimination approach. Other things you can do is a chest-directed elimination diet. So that includes skin prick testing um, to the most common like food allergies with subsequent elimination of foods with a positive test result, plus cow's milk though, because of its poor negative predictive value on skin testing. So even if it's negative, it might be one of the factors implicating or contributing to their um, symptoms. So would still add that or, or eliminate that, I mean, from diet. So let, let's talk about the, the skin testing too. Um, yeah. What, do, what do we know about skin testing and EOE other than what's just written right here? About skin testing and EOE. So, yeah. like false positives? Are you well, let's think of mechanism. What's skin prick testing assessing yeah. for? Histamine. Histamine release, Histamine release based on, on IgE cell. activation, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. And is EOE... Um, IgE mediated? No. Correct. Okay. 
So I guess I'm trying to get to the point here because this says skin prick testing performed a test for food allergies. Why? Yeah, so I was reading this on up today. And so my kind of understanding was that theoretically, like if there are food allergies and it's kind of, I was kind of thinking through, it does sound kind of weird, but I think kind of along like the lines of like the empiric elimination diet, like if there are foods that you can avoid that could possibly be contributing to it, I'm not sure, like I wouldn't think it would be a food allergy if they're not having symptoms when they eat the food, right? But I'm guessing like maybe their interpretation is like maybe they're not having like anaphylaxis, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's a good question, Dr. Miller. Yeah, the, the reason I bring it up is um, 10, 15 years ago, uh, EOE and its kind of up and coming diagnosis and, and frequency. And it was very common that the GI docs would refer them to us. Um, people did do skin and or serum all the way to patch testing with the idea that maybe we could help direct you know what foods to eliminate here just a poor understanding of EOE and I, I gotta admit I don't think we have much else that we could therapies were new um or on the on the rise but we didn't have much to help these patients um anyway and from my recall and I'm not an EOE expert is that all that testing that was done provided little benefit to the patients and we because it's it's a different mechanism so I'm not aware that people are doing that now. Again, I'm not an EOE specialist. We did have a co combined allergy GI clinic um, at one time when Dr. Dowling was here with us and one of our GI docs, but uh, that uh, went to the wayside when a couple of providers moved on. But um, I don't know, does anybody Dr. else have Pace, any other right? insight? In from I think so um, Dr. Pandya has offered for some patients in terms of like if they really want testing, but just knowing that it's a different mechanism, because I think at least for milk, like there's the there's the skin testing and the patch testing options for certain foods, but it's the negative predictive value for it is still not good in terms of for milk specifically. And then it's mm -hmm. like the patch testing is a better option, but you know, that's not like that's easily available for us to necessarily do for food um, yeah. and is has a higher negative predictive value depending on the food type, but it's not like every food you know um sure so okay I, I just question does it have any value at this point i i haven't seen data again i don't i can't be up on every topic but uh it it, it does cause pause at least I, I just wanted to make sure you guys know the standard that uh that i'm aware of is the, the testing has gone to the wayside and that we don't routinely do this unless there's other ige mediated history that would suggest to do that so um, if anybody finds some good articles and I'm misdirected, um, please send them my way. Sounds good. Yeah, we'll look into that a little bit more. Okay. The other thing I saw is elemental diet. And so patient is placed on an amino acid based like elemental formula, which kind of eliminates all the potential food allergens. This approach is most effective, but challenging to follow and can be pretty expensive. I was reading like for each um like container that a patient would have like for a meal like it's about fifty dollars so I'm, i can see that that would be hard to do why won't it go there we go next question a two-year-old boy has been diagnosed with an inborn error of immunity based on genetic testing obtained due to his clinical history his history is notable for inflammatory bowel disease liver abscesses and bull cord I can never say this one, Burkholderia pneumonia. This disorder is characterized by defective functioning in a specific immune cell. What is the major function of these cells? Sounding like um, B phagocytosis of microbes, sounds like a CGD with that Burkholderia um, capacia pneumonia to me. Exactly. Um, and I wanna make sure I don't have the other answers on the next slides. So you're right, CGD is due to the defect in the reduced nicotinamide and adenine dinucleotide phosphate or NADPH oxidative bursts carried out by neutrophils. And the major function of neutrophils is to phagocytose microbes. Do you guys remember the other bugs that are commonly seen in this disease, like infections caused by these microbes? I was thinking of like catalase positive organisms, so like staph and all that mm -hmm. stuff. 
Yep. Yeah. And I have them all Sorry, in the next one. Right? Yep. Yeah. It is. For sure. So CGD mutations in genes encoding NADPH oxidase leads to defective intracellular killing of bacteria and fungi, which can predispose to infections with catalase positive organisms. Signs, you can see granulomatous formation in the skin, lung, intestine, liver, brain, IBD-like symptoms, and perirectal disease like abscess or fistula, granulomata, obstructing respiratory, urinary, or GI tract. Um, you would have abnormal DHR assay or NBT, and then invasive, severe, recurrent infections affecting skin, lung, lymph nodes, liver, spleen, bones, and brain. And then the typical pathogens, as you said, are the catalase positive bacteria, so Staph aureus, gram negative bacilli like Pseudomonas, Aspergillus, Canada, Burkholderia, Chromobacterium, Nocardia, and then Serratia, like we mentioned. Treatment is Bactrim prophylaxis, Azole prophylaxis, interferon gamma, stem cell transplant, and gene therapy. And then on to the next question. A six-month-old infant is referred to your clinic, and he's a boy, to high concern for an underlying inborn error of immunity. He has a history of atopic dermatitis, chronic diarrhea, failure to thrive, newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes. Genetic testing results in an X-linked disorder, which CD molecules can be found on the subset of T cells affected by this condition. Sounds like I think IPEX, right? IPEX. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I so, like, yeah. And Fox P3 is CD25, so it's either answer choice B or C. I believe it's B, CD3, CD4, CD25. Yeah. yeah. Let's do it. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so you're right, IPEX or immune dysregulation, polyendocrinopathy, enteropathy, x link syndrome is caused by mutations in the gene encoding for FOXP3, the transcription factor needed for Treg cell function. And Treg cells, like you said, have markers of CD3, CD4, and CD25. Nice. Um, Next question, a 16-year-old female comes to clinic complaining of anaphylaxis that occurs a few hours after... Oops, it's supposed to be after exercising. Um, upon further questioning, you learn that she always has an afternoon snack before... Why did I put working? Sorry about that. Which foods is she likely eating prior to exercise that supports this diagnosis? Mm -hmm. I think I'm supposed to write working out. <laughs> snack before working out. Yep, wheat celery. Mm -hmm. Wheat celery, shellfish, tree nuts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, you guys are right. Those are the main ones that can are kind of associated with this. And so this is food-dependent exercise-induced anaphylaxis, a variant of exercise-induced anaphylaxis that requires ingestion of those specific foods within 40, four to six hours before vigorous physical activity. It affects females more than males, typically in their late teens to mid-30s. And the foods implicated are wheat, other grains, celery, crustaceans, cephalopods, tree nuts, tomato, mushroom, uh, tomato again, grapes and chicken. Next, have, you, have you ever seen okay. that one? I, I've seen a wheat and I've seen a celery. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. yeah but, I, I mean, it, it's rare. So. Yeah. yeah, I've seen a wheat. Not here, but yeah. Yeah, kind of interesting. What type of insect is this? Is this a yellow hornet? Or jacket? Ugh. Jacket, <laughs> yellow jacket. <laughs> Go with the first. Yellow hornet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yellow hornet, but they're pretty similar of the... <laughs> of the ones that I was looking at. And I have this slide that kind of helps with looking through them. So top left, you have honeybee, short body, bumblebee on the top right, short round body, more fuzzy. Wasp has a long thin body, and then hornet, bottom right, long broad body. 
Um, where are their nests found? I'll, I'll just, I don't know. Um, I was going to guess trees. Uh, trees, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what we're yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I totally forgot this when I was like looking through like my notes and stuff. I was like, I should just bring this one up again because I always forget. But human dwellings, this was the only mm. one that was mainly found in human dwellings. What are human dwellings? Like dead body? What is that? No, I think like areas that like are common. I interpret it as like areas like common where like not like isolated in like a tree or forest, like in a tree in a forest, but like where people are kind of around. Oh. But that's what I interpret. <laughs> Think of something that. more morbid. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, isn't that maggots? Okay. <laughs> like in a cemetery. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. The pictures of the nests are, I think, a good border view question that I see. Um... And what is the allergen associated with hornet yellow jacket? And if you guys want A, B, and C options, I have that. But I also wanted to see recall if that would be present in the memory here. Um, let's see. So isn't this the, like, antigen 5 hyaluronidase stuff? And that's oh. what these... Is that yes. what you're asking? Or are you talking about like, like the name? Or like the Vesvi? Yeah. Or... yeah, the oh, name. Okay. So the Vesvi things, numbers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because this is when you can do the AIT together, right? With the yeah. yellow jacket and the hornet. So yeah, like it's exactly. not the Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And like you, yeah. I said, hornet and yellow jacket have been in... So their best bits are cross-reactive. And then the APM1, through one, two, three, seven, and 10 are honeybee. Pole A1, A2, A5 are paper wasp. And then soul I1 and 3 are ant. And then I think for the paper wasp, it's actually supposed to be like pole D, not A. Oh, really? Yeah, I think it's a typo in the book. Oh, gotcha. Oh, okay. I think I remember Dr. Pandya mentioning that during this lecture long ago, but... I didn't remember what was the correct correction. And last but not least, which sinus develops around age three years? So, oh, how do I remember this one? Um, so you're born with the so you're born with me maxillary ethmoid, um, and then at three rhymes rhymes with. Uh, oh yeah, um, sphenoid. So it should be C, and then times two is six frontal. So it should be sphenoid C. Nice, nice work. Yeah, sphenoid develops around age three. You're born with ethmoid and maxillary sinuses, and then the frontal sinus develops around six years of age. Nice, you guys got like everything right. <laughs>